we are recording. Thank you, Chris. So yesterday early, I went with Isaac into London and we took flowers from the garden, uh, flowers we'd grown, some of the only things that didn't die in our hot summer. And we took some, some beautiful purple flowers. Um, we went to the parks by Buckingham Palace to lay some flowers for the Queen. And it was incredibly moving to go to be part of what people were doing. Um, I wanted to go to see the Queen lying in state. I, I didn't, but I did. And I, in the end, as the queues grew, knew that it wasn't really feasible. And so, like some of you, um, I watched live footage, thanks to the BBC for showing live footage of people who were going to pay their respects. And I sat for some time and watched people paying their respects in, in different ways and with different hearts and mo in their motivations. And you could see, if you watch this footage, see a lot on people's faces. It was clear that some were simply going to do something once in a lifetime, something unique, something they would say to people, I went to see the queen when she was lying in state. Some were clearly there because it was in their minds, religious duty. They went because they knew that they should and they, they were physically observing certain things like crossing themselves or other religious practices. Now, I saw some yesterday, um, and I definitely saw some as I watched the footage. There were people who had clearly served in the armed forces, and they were going there to honour their former commander-in-chief. Some were there, and they were in mourning. And I, I talked about a mourning a little bit last week in the sermon on, on, from John 14. And I want to encourage you, if you weren't here last Sunday to listen to that sermon if you can it's on the church's youtube channel if you don't have access to youtube and you want an audio copy a cd well we have wonderful tech guys we will make you copies of a cd so you can listen to what was said about mourning but i would encourage you to go back and i watched these people for some time and as they were going through the Queen's resting spot, I was praying about today and saying, Lord, we've lost this Christian Queen that we've had for many of us, for all of our lives. Um, when I was looking at some of the things that people have written yesterday in the parks, some things were very personal to them and some things reminded me. One person said, throughout most of our lives, You've been one of the common good that's happened in our world. There aren't many sources of common good that we could say, but this person recognized that the Queen was part of what was good in our world for all of these years. And so I was like, Lord, what do I say in light of this again? Because um, when we return to 1 Corinthians, to being church together, um, we'll do so, I think, after our October communion service. Um, and I knew it wasn't right to return to that because we've got a, a doozy of a scripture. Some of the issues in 1 Corinthians are, are quite big. Um, and so I was like, Lord, what do I say? And the scripture that Valerie read is, is the one that, that came to mind that I trust that the Lord gave me to speak from. And it's well known. Um, we see the 12, the 12 who are marked as apostles have been sent out in mission and the scripture tells us they worked hard. In fact, it tells us they came back, they were excited. They were tired after sharing the good news of Jesus' kingdom with many, many people. And Mark tells us, as Peter had told him, because Mark's eyewitness is Peter, um, that Jesus had tried to take them away to some rest. Now, instead of rest, because where they were, they couldn't even put food in their mouths without people coming and saying, help us, help us, help us. As they went away, instead of rest, the crowds had already beaten them to their destination. And the scripture here says that Jesus had compassion 
on those crowds. And I was reminded of Jesus' compassion as I reflected on that. Jesus always had compassion. If you go through the stories of Jesus working out God's purposes with people, if you can find one where Jesus isn't compassionate to people, come and show me, because I, I just literally cannot think of a moment where he didn't act with compassion. And it, that's even so for the ones who took him and brought him before the Sanhedrin, for the ones who whipped up lies, whipped up charges, for the ones who had him crucified, even for them, Jesus showed compassion. Jesus came to us for compassion's sake. Compassion fueled Jesus and was part of the source of the mission that he gave his disciples. We live in a world no different from many others. People say, oh, things have gotten worse. I think things have always been bad, just in different ways. In our world now, some people think that God doesn't care. God doesn't love, that even God is a monster. And sometimes people don't think that God's church is much better than God. But when we think about why God came into the world in the form of Jesus, we always can return to the truth of what John 3.16 says, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't die, but have eternal life. And as I say yesterday, I witnessed crowds, crowds coming for various reasons. And this story in Mark 6 is of crowds who flooded to the destination where Jesus would be. And they didn't all come for good reasons. They didn't all come for the best of intentions. Some of them needed help. Some of them wanted to see a spectacle. Some of them wanted to be part of something unique. Some of them were just hungry. And they'd seen that Jesus did amazing things. They wanted full stomachs. It doesn't sound too different from why people gather at these significant times still today. But as they came, in the power of God, Jesus understood them. But what he doesn't do is differentiate between them like he doesn't differentiate between us. He saw them. And he saw his disciples, and he knew his disciples were tired. But seeking to deal with those people, that great crowd, in a compassionate, loving way, Jesus then seeks to teach his children, his disciples, something more about following him. He wants to show them that they need to be compassionate as he is. His compassion comes out on all he has made. And he wants his disciples to follow him. So the crowds then are organized into groups. The disciples are told by Jesus, feed them. They cobble together five loaves. They get two fish. And they say to him, look, 200 denarii. This is years worth of earnings if we might give this crowd some food. You know, people who've looked at this story who seek to pick apart what Jesus did, say all sorts of brilliant things. They say that Jesus had pre-stored larders worth of food in the hillsides, and he got food out of the secret stores that he'd made of bread and fish, which didn't go moldy or rotten or anything like that. Um, but he went and found all of this food, and he knew how much he needed to feed 5,000 men, plus their wives, plus their children, and he secreted all of this food back out into these baskets and got the disciples to go and give it out. It's nonsense. Jesus said, organize them into groups, sit them down, bring me your bread and your fish. And then he prayed. Now, for some, feeding a crowd is too much, too many, too big a challenge. And as I think about our challenges as a church today, we might feel that our resources are not very big and do not have the capacity to go very far. We might think we can only do a minimal 
amount of work with what we have. As I saw those people walking past the Queen, as this scripture came to mind, this reminder of this word from Jesus, where he tells his disciples to do something for them. He tells them to have compassion on those people, to do something for them that they need, even though it isn't what they really need. Most of those people in that crowd, of course, they were hungry. They just followed Jesus all the way around a big lake to see what he would do. That's not what, that's not what they need. Most of the people who came to Jesus that day were lost. They were sheep looking for a shepherd. And the people in our communities, many of them are lost. They are sheep looking for a shepherd. And you and I, we know the good shepherd. We know the one who wants to have them in his care. So Jesus takes the bread, the fish, the physical offering, and he prays and kingdom power multiplies it to more than we could count. What I love about this, this story, there's two things. There's one bit I smirked at um, where Jesus walks across the lake and it sounds a bit like he's racing the boat. Um, you know, you ever done that when you've been walking? I grew up on canals. So quite often canal boats we knew could only go four miles an hour. So we'd walk and we'd be like, we'd be racing the barge going, are we going to beat the barge? And as you read that, it says Jesus walked as if to go ahead of them. I'm like, is Jesus going in his humanity? I'm going to see if I can race them in that boat, Just see if I can get ahead of them. But he doesn't, does he? He comes to them and he gets in the boat and they're terrified. They're also hard in the hearts at that time, it says, but they're terrified about what he's done. But, you know, the other thing that I, I love that makes me laugh in this story is, is that Mark tells us they ate until they were satisfied. If you've ever been to um, a free food event where people are providing the food and you're being blessed to enjoy it, um, we did mention Dot eating a lot of soup at Soup and Company. One or two else of you who'd come to Soup and Company, definitely maximize your bowls filled. Um, well, bless you for that. Well done. Um, they ate until they were filled. And I love that image, the fact that they're there and they weren't expecting necessarily food, but the disciples feed them. And then the disciples come around and go, do you want some more? Yes. Do you want some more? Yes. And I have this image in my head of these men and women and children feasting, feasting until they were satisfied from what started out as five loaves and two fishes. And look, most of them didn't know who had truly provided for them. But here's the reality. They were helped at their point of need. They were helped at their point of need. And that was what Jesus was conveying to the disciples. Now, at the end of that part of the story, the disciples have a problem. When they were too tired from their mission, when they couldn't even get a little bit of food in their mouths, they escaped in the boat with Jesus. And what did they carry with them? They had five loaves and two fishes, plus maybe some other bits. At the end of this story, they have a problem. They now have a full crowd, full crowd. Everybody's eaten until they're satisfied. And they have 12 basketfuls of food left over from this mighty miracle. 12 basketfuls. They're being reminded that each one of them is being given by God an abundance, more than they need, in order that they might go out and show compassion on people. And in that moment, not only Jesus has, not only has Jesus showed them that they should be compassionate to others, that they can use heaven's power to meet people's needs. He's also teaching them that if they're faithful to bring their offerings to him, even when times are hard, even when they're tired, even when things seem too much, that he will do many times more in provision than they could imagine or they need. As I said, we face uncertain times in church and in society. And I've been reminded by um, uh, a Christian pastor and I've seen it expressed in little ways. 
that we're in times as a church where it's more like a season that the children in the wilderness faced, where churches need to recognize our need for God to bring us our daily bread, where we need to worship God daily for his gracious, gracious, compassionate, giving hand. It's more times like that than it is the times that the children see that they had when they were in Israel, when they were settled in the land, when each one had its piece of land. And when they needed some provision, they walked into their garden and it had what it, they needed. So we're in times where those children in the wilderness had to rely on God. Now, look, it's stupidity for me to suggest that when the Israelites were in Israel, they didn't have to rely on God. But it's truthful to recognize, and testimony shows this in their lives and in ours, that it's easy to lose sight on God when everything's just a hand. Because that's what happened in Israel. God said to them, you will have your land, you will have your land, and it will provide for you. And they forgot to continue to be thankful. I've got my wheat, I've got my corn, I've got my chicken, I've got my goat, I've got what I need, I'm set. Forget God. But when they were in the wilderness, and they were told, every day I will provide for you, you can bet that people got hold of that. Because even the days when they were told, I won't provide for you the rest for the Sabbath rest, the day before you'll have a double portion, it actually says in the scripture, some people went out and looked and they found nothing. They found nothing because they had to remember that the day before God had provided for them. And so it's easy, isn't it? When times are good to lose sight of God, to not focus on God, to think that the abundance that we have is by our own doing. But it's not. Churches struggle with this as much as anywhere when they have plenty. It's easy to rely on what you have and not on the one who is giving it to you. And so here we are in uncertain times, needing to recognize that God brings us our daily bread, that God is the one that blesses the church with its finances through our giving, through sometimes offerings and miracles that we don't even expect. I brought this scripture, not because I had any, any intention of going anywhere near it until a few days ago, but feeling that it was a word for us to recognize that in the uncertainty around us, that we're reminded by the Lord that we must show compassion on the crowds. We must show compassion on the crowds. Now, look, look around at your brothers and sisters in this place. You're not, we've just recognized this morning that Dot has gone to be with the Lord. This is not a heavenly waiting room where I'm sitting here going, who's going next? Who's the next one that gets to go to glory? Because they'll be lucky and the rest of us will just have to keep waiting. That's not what this place is, is it? If you're a bit younger, you might not know what this is, but most of you, most of you know Thunderbirds. Yeah, Thunderbirds? Thunderbirds, yes, Thunderbirds. So it's not a joke about anybody being so old they're on strings, but this is not where we wait for God. This is international rescue. This is people from all over the world called together to bring people who don't yet know Jesus to a place where they meet Jesus and they give him their hearts and they're eternally rescued. So there you go. So I know you couldn't because Jerry Anderson's family might get upset, but a church's motto is much better off as international rescue than it is as anything else, because that's why we're here for. We're called to walk together as compassionate people through the storms, recognizing that Jesus is the miracle man who literally walks on water. We, not like the disciples, cannot get hard-hearted about who provides for us, about where we get it from. We must not be terrified. We must recognize that he is the one reaching out to us, as he says, as he gets in that boat and says this, take heart, it is me. 
do not be afraid. Recognizing that Dot has gone to be with Jesus. Soon we will all reach that final harbor with him. Soon we will all enter into the Father's happiness and the certainty of his kingdom come, the one that knows no ends. But until that happens, while we still draw breath, let us reach out into our world with compassion. Let us pray for miracles and let us make that kingdom come. Amen. Amen. We have two songs. And as I said the last couple of Sundays, after the songs, we'll have the fellowship time. If you stay in your seats after, during the fellowship time in these seats, we're going to assume you want prayer. So somebody nice and lovely will come and offer to pray for you. But um, also commend to you on the tables at the back there are little, um, little info pyramid things that I've made that tell you a bit more about stuff happening this autumn. Um, but we're going to sing two songs. Colin, will you tell the children we're, we're in our final worship and um, simple songs of worship?